What just happened? That was the golden question from millions this morning when a rare 4.8 magnitude earthquake rattled the Northeast. Now, the U.S. Geological Survey says more earthquakes and aftershocks are possible in the coming weeks. Hi there, I'm Valerie Castro in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Several aftershocks have already been reported from this morning's earthquake that originated in New Jersey, the strongest earthquake to hit the state in more than 240 years. It struck shortly before 1030 local time this morning, about 40 miles outside of New York City. Tremors were felt all across New York, Pennsylvania, and up through New England. A couple homes in Newark were evacuated over structural damage, and temporary ground stops were issued at Newark and JFK airports. But no injuries or other major damage have been reported so far. Are. Still, in a part of the country more accustomed to flash floods and heavy snow, the event left many shaken up. People not sure what to think, but for others, like the UN Security Council meeting in New York City, it was business as usual. You're, you're making the ground shake. <laughs> <laughs> Education is in many ways. Madam President, am I okay to continue? Moving right along, and social media was quick to react to the earthquake. Several memes and jokes have been posted, making light of it all. And at least one store in New York City already rolled out T-shirts to commemorate it, quote, surviving it. The store owner says they've sold over 100 shirts already. While earthquakes in the Northeast are rare, they are not uncommon. We've had earthquakes hit upstate New York in 2023 and Delaware in 2017. But today's event is now the strongest one to impact the East Coast since 2011, when a 5.8 magnitude earthquake struck Virginia. NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman is standing by to break down just how rare this is. But first, let's go to NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa in Lebanon, New Jersey. Emily, there are concerns over aftershocks and damage to infrastructure. What is the latest where you are? Hey there, Valerie. Well, that's because the aftershocks continue to happen around 6 p.m. this evening. We felt an aftershock that we learned was a magnitude 4.0 in this region. We felt the ground suddenly start to shake. We kind of looked up at each other with the crew here and acknowledged, did you feel that too? People started coming outside to confirm that we felt yet another aftershock. We learned that it is one of at least a dozen aftershocks since this morning. That one, that 4.0 aftershock happening not far from where I'm standing, the epicenter not far from from where I am standing. And so what officials are urging people to do if they feel an aftershock at this point is to get down, to take cover, to hold on. They do believe these aftershocks will happen for another several days, Valerie. And Emily, a lot of people were caught off guard by this early this morning. What are you hearing from them? Well, I think some important perspective is that these are incredibly rare and uncommon for people, especially in the Northeast. This was the strongest magnitude earthquake to hit the East Coast in uh, more than a decade. It also was the strongest magnitude earthquake to hit New Jersey in nearly 250 years at that 4.8 magnitude level. And so when it happened and it really was felt with reports for up to 300 miles away from the epicenter, which I'm not standing far from uh, the people were confused they were scared some people thought their homes were collapsing on them others thought it sounded like an explosion take a listen to what one woman had to say I was trying to get the kids in the basement but I was so frazzled um, because you think in your brain is something is the house gonna come down is it gonna explode that is genuinely the feeling that that it was so what's happening right now across the region that crews, first responders, police, they are going from various homes. They are checking the infrastructure, the integrity of infrastructure, buildings, homes throughout the region to make sure that there wasn't any severe damage. At this point right now, it doesn't seem like there is widespread significant damage to infrastructure. Also, there have been no reported injuries, so certainly good news there. But it's really been a scare that, uh, sent, that, that sent waves across this region 300 miles again from where I am, of a far region impact from this earthquake, Valerie. Yeah, so many people not sure what to think when it happened. Emily Aketa, thank you. 
And let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, there's a map from the U.S. Geological Survey that compared past earthquakes of similar magnitudes to each other, one in Virginia, the other in California, and it shows how the Virginia earthquake had a much wider reach. It was felt by a lot more people. So why do earthquakes that happen on the East Coast have a different impact than those in California, and how rare is it? It's rare. Right. So it's not, un, you know, it's not unheard of, but it's very uncommon. There are three reasons why we feel it a little bit more in the Northeast. The first one is, and this is so, so interesting, our rocks are denser. The reason is the Appalachian Mountains are way older than the Rockies. They're way older than Sierra Nevada Mountains. So they've been exposed to temperature pressure a little bit longer, making them more compacted, more dense. And so it's able to kind of take that energy and skew it out a little bit further. And we feel it a little bit more. You can see it on this map here almost the same magnitude in terms of the energy. But look at this, really just confined to the state of California. Now, the one that we had today, or not today, this was from Virginia in the 2011, but the one we had today, 300 miles was the width of people who felt this. And nearly 42 million Americans felt this uh, earthquake as we went through the day. This is from the 5.81 in 2011. Look how far reaching it is, even into Canada. And we did have reports today of people feeling this in Canada as well, but this went as far south as Florida. And really it's because we have a stronger crust here and it sort of spreads that energy out a little bit further. The second reason is it was a very shallow uh, earthquake. That means there wasn't a lot of space for the energy to dissipate. So once it got to the ground, we felt it a much, much quicker and we felt it a lot more. Now, also, the third reason is our buildings aren't built for this in the Northeast. California, they have a very strict code system. Engineers are there making sure that this is up to code, their buildings are up to code, so they sort of sway with the sliding of the plates where they slide underneath each other. Here, our planes plates aren't sliding. We're not on a tectonic plate. It's happening within the plate, and we don't have that sway in the buildings that's going to take the shock of what we're feeling. So yes, we had that 4.8 today, 10.23. Now we have some aftershocks that we're going to be watching over the next several days, if not weeks, and really months we could be uh, looking at some aftershocks as well. Valerie? And Michelle, I felt that aftershock that happened here a couple of hours ago. There have been a few throughout the day. How do scientists calculate the risks of the aftershocks or the threat of an even bigger earthquake? Yeah, you know, it's really, really difficult science. It's really, there's not a system that sort, you know, with, uh, with weather specifically, we can track a cold front, we can see where a tornado is going to go. There's no real system to sort of forecast an earthquake. The seismologists can look at activity, see if it's increasing. When it comes to aftershocks, they sort of look at the sequences. Right. So we've had pretty much one every single hour since 1030 this morning, really in the 2.3, 2.2, 2.0 range. We felt we didn't feel most of them until we felt the one that Emily was talking about a lot. You know, it almost looked we looked around and thought, oh, is this another one? Because it was a 0.0. And by the way, that aftershock still is in the top 10 of all earthquakes when it comes to New Jersey. Uh, the one this morning was the top three. You had to go back to the 1700s, even the 1800s to see a stronger earthquake. So this is really historical. Most of us had not felt this in our lifetime, and we may never feel it again. But still, that aftershock of 4.0, statistically speaking, 4% uh, is the statistic of seeing a 4.0 or greater magnitude earthquake after a bigger earthquake. But since we saw the 4.0 at 5 o'clock, now that percentage goes up to 78%, but still back to the 4% over 5. So we felt that at 5.59. It was about 16 miles from the first original earthquake, which, by the way, is with White House Station uh, that was updated by the USGS, which is about eight miles from Lebanon. Back to you. All right, Michelle, I know you had a busy day. Thank yeah. you so much. Sure. On the other side of the globe, Taiwan is still dealing with the aftermath of their own earthquake, which was much stronger in magnitude than what we experienced here today. The death toll there is now at 12, with around the same number of people still reported missing, according to Taiwan's fire department. Search and rescue teams are hard at work trying to get to stranded people in one national park, but continued aftershocks are complicating their efforts, with more than 50 rattling the area just last night. NBC's Janice Mackey-Frayer has more. 
For days, rescue teams have been working to reach hundreds of people stranded in the mountains inside this national park. They're cut off because the earthquake triggered landslides and there's now rock and debris blocking roads and trails. Helicopters have been taking in supplies to them like food and water to hold them over until they can be brought to safety. The priority has been airlifting those who are injured and families with children. They're then brought here where they're checked by medics and then allowed Allowed to go home. Most of the people trapped inside the park are at a hotel and they're said to be safe there, but several others, at least 18 people, are reported missing. It's why time really is crucial. Rescue officials saying they're trying to maximize the first 72 hours after the quake. Rain is beginning to complicate efforts, but the main challenge remains aftershocks. More than 400 of them now and counting. Among the people who were rescued earlier today, uh, we saw a family from Seattle. They had been in the park on a day trip. Uh, they said it has been a frightening few days, but that they're fine and they're grateful for the help. Meanwhile, in Hualien, near the epicenter of the earthquake, it's uh, building crews who are at work. They're beginning demolition on that building that's leaning precariously into the street. Local city officials telling us the concern is that one strong aftershock could bring it down. Wednesday's earthquake was the biggest to hit Taiwan since 1999. That 7.6 magnitude earthquake killed more than 2,400 people. Keeping those figures in mind, it is notable that this time for an earthquake just as powerful, the death toll and destruction is a fraction of what it was 25 years ago. So what has Taiwan done in the last two decades to improve preparedness? And what lessons can we learn in the U.S.? Let's take a look. Buildings collapsing in seconds. People trapped on remote mountain ledges. The earthquake hit Taiwan 8 a.m. local time. But Wednesday's earthquake was not the first of its kind. It was eerily reminiscent of an earthquake 25 years ago. A massive earthquake hits in the middle of the night, just before 2 a.m. A powerful jolt measuring 7.6 on the Richter scale, rocking much of this small island of some 20 million people. Despite being similar in strength, it killed more than 2,400 people. It was a tragedy Taiwan refused to go through again. 1999 earthquake in Taiwan was a really uh, a moment for upgrading all, all of Taiwan's systems. Daniel Aldrich is an infrastructure expert and a professor at Northeastern University. There was very little preparedness on the ground, and medical teams took several days to reach parts of the island. The country then began the decades-long project of revamping its earthquake preparedness system. And in those two decades, it really improved so much of their society. Building codes, top-down organizational ability, medical team distribution, even having people ready on the ground to know what to do. Uh, what we've seen in Taiwan and Japan is, during most earthquakes, buildings will sway, but not crack. That was a huge reason, I think. We saw so few deaths from building collapses in Taiwan. Geologist Larry Shihalai was living in Taiwan back in 1999. When I was 11, uh, in the mid-nine, I got shaken up in Taipei, in a big earthquake uh, hitting Taipei City. Taiwan sits along the Pacific Ring of Fire, an area responsible for about 90 percent of the world's earthquakes. He noticed the island dramatically transformed after the 1999 tragedy. So since then, um, I'm growing up and I witnessed that the changes in multiple aspects, including uh, when I in school, the public education really starting to teaching us how to deal with earthquake, what happens, how to deal with that. It's a lesson in preparedness that Aldrich says some U.S. cities should follow. Most North American cities are not prepared for a 7.4 magnitude earthquake. It's not the disaster that dictates the outcome. It's really societal preparedness and capacity that are much more uh, a direct correlation with how things go. Don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, legal problems for Combs. And no, I'm not talking about Diddy. This time, it's a sexual assault complaint against his son. We'll break down the case with our legal analyst. Plus, six months since the start of the Israel-Hamas war, and some families of hostages are still waiting for their loved ones to come home. NBC's Lester Holt speaks to the group in an exclusive interview. And later this hour, would you turn to an AI chatbot for therapy? That's exactly what some people are doing. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin will get into it in tonight's Future of Everything, so stay tuned. We've trained it to act in certain ways, but there's, there's ways that this could um, certainly go off the rails. 
It's and that, potentially dangerous. It, absolutely. The demand is overwhelming. Yes. Is this the solution? I think this is a solution. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver Rasheed Rice has apologized to the victims of a high-speed crash over the weekend. On Instagram, Rice said he takes, quote, full responsibility for his role in the crash and is cooperating with Dallas investigators. Detectives are still trying to figure out what exactly happened and who was involved. Just a few days ago, we told you how inmates in New York were suing the state over not being allowed to see Monday's solar eclipse. Turns out their wish was later granted. The state has agreed to allow the inmates to view the eclipse in accordance with their religious beliefs. The latest jobs report is showing some good signs for the economy. More than 300,000 jobs were added in March, making it the largest number of jobs added in a month for the year so far. The unemployment rate declined slightly as well, and the labor force participation rate rose, both signs of a strong economy. And Pat Sajak's final run on Wheel of Fortune is coming to an end. After four decades hosting America's Game, Sajak's final episode will air on June 7th. After that, Ryan Seacrest will take over as host. And Bronny James, the oldest son of LeBron James, declared for the 2024 NBA draft today. The former USC guard said he will also enter the transfer portal to maintain eligibility if he decides to return to college. James will meet with NBA teams to figure out if he wants to go pro. He has until June 16th to withdraw his name from consideration. And now to another lawsuit involving music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. The suit involves his 26-year-old son, Christian Combs, who is accused of sexually assaulting a woman in 2022 while she was working on a yacht chartered by his father. Sean Combs is accused of aiding and abetting in his son's alleged assault. This is just the latest in a string of accusations against Sean Combs, who has denied all allegations against him. NBC reached out to Christian and Sean Combs about the latest allegations, but we haven't heard back. NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sinadella joins us now. Angela, unlike his father, this is the first time that Christian Combs is facing allegations of sexual assault. What can you tell us about this lawsuit? Yes, so this lawsuit alleges that there was sexual assault, sexual harassment, also intentional infliction of emotional distress. And this employee was on this yacht that this employee was an employee of a yacht that was chartered by Diddy. And she claims that he forced her into trying to have oral sex with him, that she that he harassed asked her that he also maybe even spiked her drink. So these are huge allegations. Now, Diddy is involved because he's the one who chartered the boat. So he's also being sued for premises liability for being responsible for the entire situation. And so we know last month the FBI raided Diddy's properties, uh, a, a place in Los Angeles, a place in Miami, in connection to a federal sex trafficking investigation. How does this new lawsuit add to all of the legal issues he's already facing? Yeah, this is a big deal. So the lawsuit that are civil don't necessarily affect each other. But any time a new lawsuit like this is filed, the investigators of any criminal investigation get very excited because they have more access, they have more people to talk to, they just have a lot more information. So it is likely if they haven't already, they will reach out to this victim, they will try to talk to her. And also, these allegations aren't just between her and him. She also alleged that she saw things like women falling down after having alcohol. So the alleged implications there is that they were drugged. Also, she says there were a rotating door of sex workers who seemed to be on the boats as well. So all of this information is very valuable to investigators. Yeah, some similar allegations that we've heard in some of those other lawsuits as well. This new lawsuit also has audio recordings of this alleged assault. How could that implicate both Christian and Sean Combs? What does this mean for their case? Yeah, this is actually the most exciting thing for, frankly, both investigators and for the lawsuit itself. So the audio recording seemed to indicate that she did not want this to happen, that she was fighting him off. Now, the biggest problem with any sort of lawsuit like this that turns into a he said, she said, is that if it happened behind closed doors, you can't necessarily prove that something happened, right? You need some sort of documentation. So if there is video or audio, that helps your case extraordinarily. Now, the reason why investigators are also excited is because then they also have access potentially to audio or video recording that was on this boat, that was on these. They can subpoena these. Mm -hmm. They can ask, well, who else was taking video? So they then will have more documentation. So any form of recording is gold in a lawsuit like this. So it'll both help the plaintiff here and also the criminal prosecutors. All right. Evidence in this case could be very interesting. Angela, thank you so much. I appreciate your time.
And turning now to the deadly bridge collapse in Baltimore, President Biden toured the wreckage today by helicopter, getting an aerial view of the damage. He also met with the families of the six victims. He vowed that the federal government would not rest until the bridge has been rebuilt. I'm here to say your nation has your back, and I mean it. Your nation has your back. This comes as authorities recover the body of another victim, according to his family. Let's go to NBC News correspondent George Solis for the latest. And Valerie, the family of Maynard Sandoval Suazo confirming to NBC News that their loved one was found today. They now have to wait a day or two for the body to be processed, according to the brother who told me earlier this morning they were asked to come to an undisclosed location. What's unclear at this point is whether or not that body was found in a vehicle, as we learned two of the bodies were shortly after that bridge collapse. All this comes as today I actually spoke with one of the survivors of the Francis Scott Key collapse, Julio Cervantes, who was bedridden last week when I spoke with his wife. Today, answering the door, the family's still not commenting as they're still recovering from the loss of two of their loved ones on the bridge, but again, appearing in much better spirits. And all of this, of course, unfolding as President Biden was in town today, not only getting a briefing on some of the recovery efforts there at the site of where the bridge was, but also an update on how soon things may start to move with the cleanup, but also meeting with the family members, wearing that role of consoler in chief, reflecting on his own personal loss as he talked to these family members. And all of this here, Valerie, as there is a vigil and a memorial plan this weekend at this mural that sits here behind me. This is where the community has come to pay their respects to those men, those men that lost their lives there, and the four that were identified, now three by our count. And again, hundreds are expected here. Again, this bridge meant so much to this community beyond just the infrastructure. This was a part of the Baltimore community. It really was a symbol of pride and again the investigation into all of this still ongoing the ntsb saying a preliminary report expected in the two to three weeks but of course the comprehensive investigation could take years valerie okay george solis thank you Welcome back. World Central Kitchen is demanding an independent investigation into the Israeli strikes that killed seven of its workers. That story in a moment. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. In Spain, two-time Tour de France winner Jonas Vingard got into a hard crash during a race yesterday. He and three other cyclists were hurt in an accident in the fourth stage of the Tour of the Basque Country race. Vingard broke his collarbone and several ribs. He's in stable condition and is still in the hospital. He was 21 miles away from the finish line. Officials in Denmark are saying a tech error in one of its Navy missiles might make it launch by accident. There's no risk of it exploding, but it could still send fragments into the ocean. The problem came up while the military was testing the missile. The country shut down ship traffic through the Great Belt Strait, one of the world's busiest sea lanes. It's the last Friday of Ramadan, a special day of solidarity for Palestinian supporters. In Jerusalem, tens of thousands of Muslims gathered for a final Friday prayer. In other countries, crowds protested and rallied against Israel's role in the ongoing war against Hamas. McDonald's is set to buy ownership of all 225 restaurants in its Israel franchise. A local Israeli company has owned the stores for 30 years. This comes after months of lower sales for the fast food chain due to the pro-Palestinian boycotts during the Israel-Hamas war. Just a day after that tense call between President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel has now announced new steps to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. It has also released the results of its preliminary investigation into that Israeli strike that killed seven aid workers from Chef Jose Andres's World Central Kitchen. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more. Tonight, the U.S. is cautiously welcoming Israel's commitment to open more aid routes into Gaza after a tense phone call between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The president declining today to answer whether he'd threaten Netanyahu with stopping military aid. I asked them to do what they're doing. What Israel is doing is opening a crossing to allow aid into northern Gaza, using a port in southern Israel as a supply hub and allowing trucks from nearby Jordan to bring aid through Israel into Gaza. Today, the president was also asked if his tougher tone with Netanyahu meant he was abandoning Israel. 
The Israeli military has removed two officers from their post and reprimanded three others after this week's deadly strike that killed seven aid workers from Chef Jose Andres' World Central Kitchen. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. According to Israel's newly released report, its forces wrongly identified what they thought was a gunman on one of the aid trucks and mistakenly assumed there were Hamas terrorists inside. The forces did not identify the vehicles in question as being associated with World Central Kitchen, calling it a serious failure. It was a terrible chain of errors, and it should never have happened. World Central Kitchen says the admissions are important steps forward, but the charity is calling for an independent investigation because it says Israel's military cannot credibly investigate its own failure in Gaza. Hostage talks are set for this weekend. A senior administration official says the president is urging the leaders of Egypt and Qatar to press Hamas for a deal. Six months after the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel, the families of five Americans held hostage in Gaza are still waiting for proof of life and the safe return of their loved ones. NBC News nightly anchor Lester Holt sat down with them to talk about their pain, their frustrations, and their hopes. We all know that they have seen the, the power of hope. Theory. Abigail was released on the 51st day of being a hostage. You know, they have seen nightmares come true. My sister, Judy Weinstein Chagi, my amazing sister, and her beloved husband, Gadi Chagi, were um, out for their early morning walk on October 7th and were the first victims of this terror um, when they were murdered um, by Hamas, ISIS, terrorists on motorcycles. They were shot, murdered. We learned that news uh, about 76 days after that event. Well, for five months, <clears throat> my American <laughs> born and raised cousin Ruby and his lovely wife, Hagit, believed that their son, 19-year-old Itai, was alive. They got the bad news, the unimaginable news, about three weeks ago, that he was actually amongst those who were murdered on October 7th. For some of these American families, the fates of their kidnapped loved ones are still unknown and they're desperate for them to come home. It's hard for anyone to step into your shoes and to imagine what it's been like. How do you put one foot in front of the other? Like I live my life in, in agony, in sadness, like I'm worried sick for my boy. Like every minute of the day, every second of the day, I don't have nights, I don't have, I don't have anything like, but I need to continue with what we are doing, like to put it out there. Out there, exactly. Mm. Freed hostages have told horrific stories of violence and sexual abuse at the hands of Hamas. I want to ask you about some of the reports we've heard from hostages who have been freed about their treatment in captivity. For those of you who s still have missing loved ones, is that something you need to hear or something you'd rather not hear about? It's very difficult. I don't like you to know, hear you, about it. My aunt Aviva and uncle Keith uh, Siegel were both taken together and Aviva was released on day 51, the same day that Abigail was released and she's home and were just, I don't even know how to express the amazing feeling, yet at the same time, Keith is there. She knows exactly what Keith and all of the hostages are going through every single day. And I just want to underline the urgency. The opportunity for a deal is not going to get any better than it is today. And I just, I think that's why we're all here today, the urgency and hearing Aviva's stories, it's, you know, it's horrific. All the testimonies, my heart just breaks. These are living, breathing human beings. Prime Minister Netanyahu, he needs to be that brave leader. He needs to be that powerful, strong leader. And he needs to make it clear. He's been talking for many months about how important hostage release is. We've, we don't have any more time for talking. I asked about four-year-old Abigail. How is her emotional healing progressing? What can you share with us? She is a beautiful child who, before the terrorist attack on October 7th, was running around barefoot and playing and dancing to Beyonce videos and just this beautiful life. She is able to do those things again. 
So on a day-to-day -day level, she is loved by family and she is doing wonderfully. But we all know that there is effects of seeing your parents murdered. Earlier in the crisis, the group met with President Biden at the White House. Do you feel the Biden administration still puts you and your loved ones as a priority? We feel that uh, we get attention and support from the Biden administration. But at the end of the day, we need our loved one back. They need to pull every lever and it hasn't been done or else we would have had our dear ones back home. Are you still talking to the administration? Yeah, Are you hearing yes. this? I, yeah, oh, absolutely. Sure. I mean, we have an extraordinary amount of access and they're incredibly transparent and available. Are the Israeli army actions in Gaza right now complicating <clears throat> any effort to get your loved ones? That's the pressure on Israel to stop the fight and provide ceasefire and, and humanitarian support to Gaza is obviously increasing, yet Hamas, ISIS can stop everything by releasing the hostages and putting down the weapons. There's a surplus of suffering going around and horrible mistakes are happening. The tragic, horrifying mistake of those seven aid workers getting killed. It's a straw that's breaking the camel's back. What happens when you begin to lose sympathy? Do any of you feel that that is occurring? It's a struggle, Lester. But we need to recognize that that chain reaction that brings us, unfortunately, back to you after many months was unleashed on October 7th by Hamas in an unprovoked, savage massacre of civilian communities. Look at Gaza. How can you not look at that and, um, and not feel unbelievable sympathy, right, for the suffering that's going on there? And here we are with our love, our innocent loved ones, hostages for 181 days, hidden in tunnels. They kind of disappear in this horror that's going on. And there's no question that it feels like the world is moving on. If you look at the Gaza border, which is where my son was abducted from it's he's two three miles away they're so close and yet so far and yet Hamas is still holding on to them but what keeps them going that's one line that we say every single day in our house and someone gave it to us in a sticker because we say it so much hope is mandatory Lester Holt thank you Still to come, a convicted murderer whose case gained national attention in the early 90s is pushing for his death sentence to be overturned. Next, to look back at the death of 12-year-old Polly Kloss and why her killer is hoping a judge reconsiders all these years later. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You might remember the case surrounding the murder of Polly Kloss. Well, her killer is back in court today. We'll get to that in a moment, but first here are some of the other stories happening out west that we're following. Officials say they found elevated levels of ketamine in the pilot of a hot air balloon crash that killed three other people back in January. The NTSB said there weren't any mechanical issues, but a bag that fills with hot air to make the balloon rise might have led to the crash in Eloy, Arizona. The case still remains under investigation. Staying in Arizona, a fox that attacked three hikers at Saguaro National Park this week has been euthanized. All three people made it out okay. Two of them fought off the fox with their trekking poles. Officials say they are now testing the fox for rabies. And a former New Mexico public school bus driver has pleaded guilty to several rape cold cases that happened between 1988 and 1991. Investigators used DNA collected from the bus steering wheel, a gear shift, and switches to link him to the assaults. He now faces up to 30 years in prison. Decades after a horrific kidnapping and murder that sparked California's three strikes law, the convicted killer is fighting to have his death sentence reconsidered. Richard Allen Davis confessed to murdering 12-year-old Polly Kloss in Petaluma, California back in 1993. The girl was hosting a slumber party with friends when Davis kidnapped, then strangled her in a ditch. At the time, Davis had a lengthy criminal rap sheet. His conviction led to the California law, which calls for life sentences for repeat offenders. Davis is 
currently on California's death row, which has been paused under a moratorium signed by Governor Gavin Newsom. Since the conviction, state lawmakers have also enacted new rules that water down the three strikes law. Today in court, Davis's lawyers made the case that because of that criminal justice reform, their client's sentence should be vacated. NBC's Steve Patterson is following this story for us from Los Angeles. Steve, what exactly is Davis's argument here and how is the victim's family reacting? Yeah, Valerie, if I can, I just want to set the stakes for anybody that is maybe younger watching this. This case was an absolute blockbuster. I remember this as an eight-year-old boy in Michigan. This, of course, happening in California because my mom was freaking out about, about reading about this and seeing this on, on television, specifically in 1996 when that sentencing came down on Davis and this iconic, infamous image of him flicking the camera off, giving the cameras the middle finger as he's being sentence just colossal and to think that this is now the guy that 30 years later is asking for remorse asking to have this sentence essentially expunged and reevaluated is just incredible to think about so in effect as you mentioned there have been criminal justice reforms a lot of it has to do with the fact simply that California prisons have been overcrowded since then and so to deal with that a lot of politicians have gone into the structuring of sentences specifically in enhancements that were put on more minor sentences like drug sentences to have those expunged in essence to keep the populations of prisons a little bit more down the question that davis is essentially asking and it's a simple one is does this apply to a horrific murder a senseless crime like the murder of a 12 year old girl that is the position that he's posing essentially to a judge to find out if that sentence can be dismantled, restructured, and relitigated essentially. The you asked about the parents of Kloss. We know that Mark Kloss has been an advocate since his daughter's death. He, as I've been reading in reports, has been described as both furious and hopeful that a judge will not let something like this happen, but only time will tell at this point. Valerie? And Steve Davis is on death row, but even if he loses this case, if he loses this appeal to the judge, he won't necessarily be put to death anytime soon, though, right? He, he won't. As you mentioned, Gavin Newsom, uh, the governor of California, has not been shy about dismantling the death penalty in California. It has not happened. But there has been a moratorium, a stay put on essentially folks that are condemned at this point. So even if the judge says, no, you still have to be condemned, you keep, you know, essentially the same sentence that you had, uh, nobody is being put to death at this point right now. That is per this 2019 ruling uh, until maybe somebody else is filling that place in the administration. Valerie? Okay. We know you'll be watching this closely. Steve Patterson, yeah. thank you. When you think of going to therapy, you might imagine a cozy office space or clicking a link to join a virtual meeting. But what if your therapist was an AI chatbot? With the rise of AI, your phone can become a mental health tool at your fingertips. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin spoke with one researcher who is hoping to get the first FDA-approved AI tool for therapy. How have things been going since we last connected? It could be the beginning of any standard therapy session. It's okay to not be okay. But neuroscientist Daniel Toker is talking to a machine. Obviously, I know it's not sentient, it's not a person, but it feels that way. He's been using ChatGPT for about a year, in addition to his actual therapist. It honestly surprised me how well it worked and how useful a tool it's been. OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, says it's not a replacement for mental health treatment, and we encourage users to seek support from professionals. And while multiple studies show ChatGPT can provide valuable support, the American Psychological Association is concerned with generative AI-powered chatbots being used for mental health. I think it's really important for individuals to understand that not only is this not a replacement for a human provider, the chances that it could provide inaccurate information is just too high. There is one FDA-approved chatbot that offers scripted therapeutic responses, but none with generative AI, where the bot learns about you and offers individualized replies. I am feeling like I want to get back together with him. At Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, Nicholas Jacobson hopes to change that. Most people don't receive any type of mental health care. And a lot of that is, I think, a scale problem. Mental Health America estimates more than 28 million U.S. adults with a mental illness are not getting treatment.
Jacobson wants Therabot, now in clinical trial, to become the first FDA-approved generative AI chatbot for mental health. How does it compare with an actual therapist? So generally right now, the content's pretty similar. It's how available it is. Therabot's available 24-7. For now, it's text-based. The user types for on-screen responses. With more than 200 test participants now using the data train bot for therapy, each conversation is scrutinized. We want it to say certain things, and we've trained it to act in certain ways. But there's, there's ways that this could um, certainly go off the rails. And that, potentially dangerous. It, absolutely. The demand is overwhelming. Yes. Is this the solution? I think this is a solution. One that, if it works, could go a long way to help America's mental health crisis. Erin McLaughlin, NBC News, Hanover, New Hampshire. Have you ever thought about harnessing solar power in space? Well, one university in the United Kingdom is trying to create a power station of the future, a solar farm in space. Sky News correspondent Thomas Moore explains. In a special lab that screens out electrical interference from today's world, they're testing a prototype of the power station of tomorrow. Scaled up, this would be a solar farm in space, generating electricity from constant sunlight, then beaming it back to Earth. At Queen's University in Belfast, they've shown the system works, lighting up a sign with power transmitted wirelessly across a room. Space-based solar power is the concept of harvesting the solar energy in space where it's abundant and available day and night and sending that to earth and so that we can have abundant affordable and reliable energy all the time day and night and through all weather and seasons by the end of the decade the british company space solar hopes to have a power station in orbit a mile wide it would beam power back to a receiving station anchored out at sea enough for more than a million homes the beam is a microwave, but it's not like some kind of death ray. It has just a quarter of the power of the midday sun. I can safely step in front of it. Even when this is scaled up, nobody is going to get fried. It only makes sense because of the most powerful rocket ever built. The new SpaceX Starship is likely to reduce launch costs to as little as 1% of what they were just 20 years ago. It should make it possible to generate electricity for a quarter of the price of nuclear energy on Earth. This independent engineer says it's the giant leap the world needs. As a society, we have outgrown this planet, so it's only natural that we reach out to space. And provide power from space. It definitely was a sci-fi idea when I was young, uh, but technology has advanced so much, I believe this is definitely something we could see in our lifetime. There is still much to prove, not least that it's possible to build such a vast power station in orbit with robots. But the potential is so great that the UK is one of several countries now looking to keep the lights on from space. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Belfast. A group of high schoolers in Hawaii received a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. They were invited to perform hula at the Merry Monarch Festival, a week-long cultural celebration. Many of these dancers lost their homes in last year's wildfires, but their passion for dance remains strong. For tonight's 60 Seconds of Joy, our friends at our Hawaii affiliate have their story. Oh. Students in Lahaina Luna High School's hula class spent their Tuesday afternoon finalizing a few things before their early morning flight to Hilo this morning. During spring break, I get a call from Noel saying, hey, I just got out of a meeting with on the Mayor Committee and they want to know if you guys can perform on the Hoike stage. This was her students' reaction when she told them the news. Oh no. where we're going to ask everybody, no matter where you're at, you're at home, you're in the stadium, to ku iluna and join us um, for uh, a song of solidarity, a hula of solidarity, as we do Puamana together to represent our Lahaina. Much of Puamana was destroyed in the fires last August. This happening is honestly something that could heal us from, um, <laughs> from going through something like this and then going to something that we would love to do is just so heartwarming. That does it for us tonight. I'm Valerie Castro. We'll see you Monday, but until then, stay tuned now. 
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.